William Gargan stars as Barry Craig, confidential investigator. The old saying, early to rise, folks, can't possibly mean a thing to a corpse. Your Pontiac dealer presents William Gargan in another transcribed drama of mystery and adventure with America's number one detective, Barry Craig, confidential investigator. Barry Craig speaking. The trick in continuing on as a confidential investigator is to keep on good terms with the police. Comes time for your license renewal and a department sawhead can louse it up for you. Play footsie with a corpse, conceal evidence, rack up as many black marks as you must, but be sure you've got a friend somewhere in the higher echelons. I say like a lieutenant willing to countersign your renewal application where it reads character references. Ah, the fool that I am, Craig, endorsing your application. Your signature goes down here, Trav. No blotting now. Right neat. Certifying you as a man of good character. However will I atone for the perjury? The guilt get too much for you. I can refer you to a high bridge. Okay, I've signed. You're free to harass and otherwise misuse and abuse me for 12 more months. I'm looking forward to it, chum. I'd start in right away if I had a case. Oh, don't tell me the great man's idle. One meal away from pouring my badge, unless you've got an idea. I get the hint. Even if I could, why should I throw anything your way? Because you hate seeing me fall dead from hunger. So what case did you have in mind? Two cases. You even have a choice. Hmm. Both of them prefer a confidential operative to official police methods, official notoriety. I was asked to recommend someone. I'm all ears. Case one. A Mrs. Cora Talbot wants help in finding her husband, Stanley Talbot. Talbot's been missing more than six years. What's her motive in looking for him now? Oh, a last-ditch search. She's about lost hope that he'll ever return. She wants to petition to have him declared legally dead so she can remarry. Interesting? How big a fee? Twenty dollars a day in expenses. Kind of anemic. It's all the lady can afford. Is it no? What's my alternative? A publisher named Hillary Grayson... He ran a best first novel contest, $50,000 to the winner. And? The prize-winning manuscript was stolen, very mysteriously. What's it worth to Grayson to get the manuscript back? A flat $2,000. So, which of the two has you seething with a desire to see justice done? Well, I don't want to be mercenary. Ah, then you'll accept Mrs. Cora Talbot. I'll call and tell her. Call and tell publisher Grayson. It's not on account of the higher tab. The fact is, I've been a long time wanting to raise my cultural level. The publisher, Grayson, had more body than any one guy needed. Three sets of jowls and thick eyeglasses. Looking into his eyes was like watching fish in an aquarium bowl. Get that manuscript back, Mr. Craig. Spare no effort or expense. If the manuscript isn't recovered, I'll be the jackass of the publishing world. I, I, Hold I, on a minute, Grayson. You're forgetting I don't know what it's all about. I just got here. Yes. I suppose I should give you the facts. It would be helpful. The prize-winning book manuscript, The Cry of the Hyena, by Eric Trent, was stolen right out of my office. That's bad? Catastrophic. It was the only copy in existence. The author has no carbon duplicate. How come? Writers usually make copies. Usual writers usually do. But this is no usual writer. This is Eric Trent. Yeah, here's his photograph. Hmm. I get what you mean by this one not being usual. Does he always wear chin whiskers? Yes. Trent's a brilliant eccentric. A man who's roamed every corner of the world. A wanderer who wrote one page here, another page there. Six years in the writing and more than a thousand pages. And no carbon. First prize was $50,000? Yes. Were there other awards? One other. $5,000, a second prize. Won by? Oscar Sachs for his novel, Four Devils and a Midget. Oh, this is a photograph of Oscar Sachs. Well, this one's clean-shaven. 
Uh, can I talk out of turn, or are you the sensitive type? Ask me whatever you like. $55,000 in prize money. Isn't that a lot of cabbage for a... For, for a, a small publisher? Your offices haven't exactly got that mahogany and chromium look. The prize money doesn't really come from me. It doesn't? An independent motion picture company, Pyramid Pictures. They pay the prizes in exchange for world rights to film the book. Any more questions? Yes. How many offices are there in this suite? Six. Why do you ask that? I'm already in there pitching for you. That intercommunications box on your desk. Is every office equipped with one? Yes, of course, but I don't... The box is switched on, as you'll notice. It's been on through this whole talk we've just had. Who in the Grayson Publishing House would be interested in uh, uh, long-range eavesdropping? I don't know. Suppose I find out. But I didn't find out. The eavesdropper resented my curiosity with all his might. An inkwell pitched at me. Ladies and gentlemen, have you driven a great new 1952 Pontiac? Until you do, you cannot possibly appreciate what Pontiac's dual-range performance really means. Only with your own hands on the wheel, your own foot on the accelerator of a Pontiac, can you know what it means to select with a flick of a finger exactly the power you want. Tremendous get-up-and-go in traffic, or smooth, easy-going, gas-saving cruising on the open road. The great new Pontiac gives you this kind of performance because Pontiac has, for the first time, combined the three essentials of top-flight performance in one great car. First, a terrific high-compression Pontiac engine. Second, the wonderful new General Motors dual-range hydromatic drive. Third, Pontiac's new high-performance economy axle. It's this great powertrain which makes dual-range performance giving you exactly the power you want, when you want it, where you want it. Remember, only the new Pontiac has dual-range performance. Only your Pontiac dealer can show you this engineering masterpiece. Before you consider any new car, be sure you visit your nearest Pontiac dealer. See the new Pontiac. Drive it yourself. You won't be very many miles down the road before you heartily agree that dollar for dollar... You can't beat a Pontiac. And now, back to Barry Craig. My eyes opened on Grayson, sprinkling water on me with a sponge. You're all right. Quit watering me. I'm not a petunia, Ben. But you were unconscious. I'm conscious now, and you're ruining my suit. It's ruined anyhow, the ink from the inkwell. Don't tell me. Red ink yet. My fee's gone up, Grayson. Up? 2000 plus 49.75, the price of this suit. A while later, on the street outside the Grayson offices, a motorist tooted me over. A long hair driving a sky-blue pink jalopy. I let him pick me up. You paging me, friend? Uh, yes, I, I'd like to talk to you. What about? Uh, if you'll get in, we can go somewhere. I'll buy you a drink. Oh, buttermilk. There's a buttermilk bar over on 8th Avenue. <laughs> buttermilk bar. We had a chat for the books. I'm Oscar Sachs. I know that. I saw that photograph of you in the Grayson Publishing offices. Oh. Well, there's some facts about the book contest I think you should know. Why? Why? You, you've you been engaged by Mr. Grayson to locate Trent's missing manuscript. What am I wearing? A sandwich sign? I, I obtained the information through sources I cannot disclose. Give me those facts. I won the second prize of $5,000, but I was cheated. Cheated out of the big money, is it? Yes. Explain, please. The contest rules clearly specified that the award was to be made only to an American author. And? I have reason to believe Eric Trent is an Englishman, or anyhow other than an American. Uh, to put it bluntly, a fake who should be disqualified. Disqualified while you're moved up to first place and $50,000? Yes. 
Let's have your bill of particulars. Well, for one thing, Trent's way of talk. It's as English as the House of Parliament. Uh, another thing, Trent was somewhere overseas on a tramp island in English possession when he sent the manuscript in. That summarizes it? Well, there's more. Trent has a tattoo on his right arm. I happened to get a good look at it. It's a tattoo of the British flag. Would an American wear the British flag on his arm? They tell me Benedict Arnold did. You're really out to grab yourself 50 Gs. Well, why do you find that so odd, Craig? Just that I thought artists had no money sent. Well, I have, and I'm not apologizing for it. Okay, I've got your point of view, Oscar. Oh, yes, one little thing remains. Hold out your hands. But the, uh, hold out Do my... what Papa asks. Red ink smudges on your right thumb. You've been playing with inkwells, Sonny. Oh, well, Craig, I didn't mean... Uh-uh, don't apologize. Fun's fun. And I like to play myself. My interest runs to sugar bowls. Oh, Craig, no! No! Eric Trent's address, furnished me by Grayson, was a rickety studio walk-up. Seventh Heaven in Bohemia, Greenwich Village. The door opened on a blonde who eyed you as if she was already counting your money. Hi. Hello. This is 6D, isn't it? That's what it says on the door. It's my astigmatism. Is Eric Trent in? No, but I am. Baby, I'm not a gentleman caller. So who's tough luck, would you call it? Come in. Trent said for you to wait if you simply had to see him. Trent expected me? Yeah. That Mr. Grayson, the publisher, he phoned and said you might be over. You're Barry Craig, the detective, he said. A Barry Craig, confidential investigator. I'm Judy. Judy Joy. Well, come on in. I won't bite you. I was waiting for you to make that promise. I live right next door in 6E. I come in here to play the radio. Mine's out of order. Oh. That's Bummy Fiegel's band's orchestra you're hearing. Oh. It's on every day this hour. Mm -hmm. I get simply dilapidated if I miss hearing Bummy. Uh, come again. Did you say dilapidated? Yeah. Dilapidated, like frazzled. You know, fractured. Or were you correcting me on the word? Oh, no, no. Eric's always correcting me on the word. Imagine me keeping company with a real live author type. Sure I can. I can even imagine 50,000 reasons. Huh? What'd you say? Oh, there's Eric now. Eric? Ah, oh, Judy. On the sofa's Barry Craig, the investigator. I've been keeping him here for you. Thank you, Judy. Now, if you'll leave us alone. Sure. I've got to slip the press anyhow. Nice meeting you, Mr. Craig. I was flawed myself. Excuse me while I shut off the musical background. Now, Mr. Craig, the object of this visit? Your stolen brainchild, what else? But what can I do about it? I submitted it in good order. I'm not responsible for its disappearance. How come only one copy? Why didn't you type up a carbon duplicate? I have no patience with purely clerical details. I'm an artist. But the full risk of losing the one copy. I'm a man who takes risks, Craig. In my years abroad, away from America, I've lived a life of risks. Skip the personal build-up. Wherever I went, I traveled lightly. Suit on my back, pipe tobacco, and a pencil. It was enough of a nuisance carting one copy of a thousand pages around. And how was I to know my confounded book would ever get to a publisher, much less win a prize? Okay for that. What's your, uh, guess on the missing manuscript? Grayson. What motive? A stunt. Grayson intends exploiting this whole affair for all the publicity he can wring out of it. It's an angle. The 50,000. Would you say you, uh, won it legitimately? Legitimately? I mean, uh, what if you were to be disqualified as the first prize winner, say on a technicality? What? technicality. Not actually being of American origin, as the contest rules specify. But I am an American. With a British accent? <laughs> I've spent years in the islands, in Jamaica and British Somalia. I'm told you have a tattoo of the British flag on your right arm. So? Well, I sailed the seven seas, and like a sailor, I had myself decorated with tattoos. But the British flag on an American citizen. Ah, wait until I open my shirt. There. Are you looking at the tattoo on my chest, Mr. Craig? Yeah. 
The American Eagle. What do you know? Expand your chest, genius. Expand my... I want to see old Baldy flap his wings. The first break in the case developed over the phone. I was in my office, soaking my feet. Barry Craig speaking. Hey, this is Grayson. What gives? It's about the stolen manuscript. Listen carefully. Shoot. A hoodlum named Mike Kelsey got in touch with me. He admitted to stealing the manuscript. Why did he? A mistake, he says. He was under the impression that it was valuable. A rare manuscript. <laughs> Believe that. He wants to return it now and no questions asked. How much loot is he after? One thousand dollars. It's paying ransom, compounding a felony. I must have the manuscript back, Craig. I told him to negotiate the transfer through you. You're representing me in the matter. Where's the thousand? I'm sending the money over to you in cash by messenger. You're to meet this Mike Kelsey in the tavern. The flying horse. Craig, be discreet. Sure, sure, I'll be discreet. The cash came by messenger, okay. And I got to negotiate in the flying horse tavern. A mug with heavy artillery bulging his coat, waiting at a table for me. You Mike Kelsey? No, I'm, uh, McGuire. I'm here for Mike. Hey, you're negotiating for Grayson, so I'm here negotiating for Mike Kelsey. Now, let's negotiate without any monkey business, Craig. Why a gun under both armpits, Buster? So as I don't develop a stoop on one side? Oh. Now, here's your manuscript. Right in the wrapping, Mike Kelsey found it in. Now, count me out a fast grand. Yeah, $1,000. Count it yourself. Yeah, it seems okay. Hey, don't be stupid enough to stop me from leaving. The publisher, Grayson, was out. Would I please call later, a secretary told me. I'd gone back to my office to cool my heels for a while when the phone rang. Barry Craig speaking. Uh, Craig, this is Oscar Sachs. Now watch your beef. Craig, I've discovered something I think you'll want to know. Something that will promote you into the 50 Gs? Something that won't help Eric Trent any. Craig, the man's a fraud. You're playing a cracked record, Junior. Am I? Come hear me out and then tell me that. All right, I'll come hear you out. As soon as I dry my feet and rustle up a change of socks... I didn't get to hear Sax out. To achieve that, I'd first have to perfect a way of communicating with the dead. I left Oscar Sax as I found him, sprawled backwards over a writer's desk, a knife standing vertically in his Adam's apple. I left him as is, so Lieutenant Trav Rogers wouldn't howl to heaven and the D.A. that I'd once more tampered with a corpse. Grayson drooled with joy supreme over the recovered manuscript. This is a load off my mind, Craig. A big load. But it solves nothing. Who stole it and why? And why was Sachs murdered between the time he phoned me and the time I got to his flat? I'll show you the manuscript, Grayson, and then I've got a question. Here. Examine it and then tell me. Is this the same manuscript that was stolen? The same? Why, sure it is. The Cry of the Hyena by Eric Trent. Examine the manuscript, not just the title page. Study a few sample pages. Yeah. It's the same. You'll swear to that? On a stack? No. No, I won't swear. You've detected something? Some changes? Yes. I think yes. For one thing, this copy is cleaner. The edges of the pages aren't so ragged from handling. As you remember them to have been. Yes, even the title page looks altered now. I remember a burn here in the upper right corner near the author's name. A burn like from an accidental cigarette ash. I'm convinced. This isn't the copy that was stolen. But what can it mean? I aim to find out. Grayson. Yes? Phone Eric Trent. Get him to come here to your office on some pretext. But why? So 
so I can have the run of his studio without Trent being the wiser or being present. Eric Trent had all the accumulated junk of a guy with a passion for changing climates. Souvenirs from Bombay, the Dutch Indies, Labrador. Souvenirs in brass, carved ivory, porcelain. And in the bottom bureau drawer, a manuscript. The Cry of the Hyena, with a cigarette burn on the title page. Eric Trent had stolen his own manuscript. I had the evidence in hand, but keeping it wasn't going to be so simple. A lady was against it. A lady healed with a gun twice the size of her dainty, lotioned hand. Miss Judy Joy. Yes, Mr. Craig. Miss Judy Joy. Through the uh, convenient connecting door? I heard noises in here, and I made it just in time to catch a burglar. Drop that manuscript. You charm me into it. Want a word of advice, beautiful? No. I thought you would. Ring off Eric Trent as fast as you can flick your glamorous eyebrows. You're crazy. Being true to Trent's an awful waste of war paint now. What are you trying to tell me? That Trent's value on the hoof has just been slashed by about $50,000. He... He won't get the money? Neither will you get the money. You're a liar. The Dutch uncle. I'd hate to see you dragging your gorgeous chassis up the river Sundays, visiting ye author in the big house. Pour me a drink. Still making with the gun? Aimed at your head while we wait for Eric. The stuff's on that coffee table there. The soda bottle's right alongside it. Okay, I'll play bartender. Say when. When? How much soda? Just a squirt. That's enough. Spot more, huh? Just enough to dampen your spirits? Had enough? She's no good. Roll down. <laughs> we held an all-night session. Me, Lieutenant Trav Rogers, and Grayson, comparing the two manuscripts page for page. It was early dawn before I found a discrepancy between the two versions. You found something, Craig? Yes, Trav. A Cora Lane's disappeared from the substituted version. Who's Cora Lane? Tell him, Grayson. Cora Lane is a character who appears early in the novel. A woman the hero meets and falls in love with. She's in version one. She's out of version two. Now, why would the author go to all the trouble he did? Submitting a manuscript and then stealing it back just to write a character out of the book. Because the name Cora Lane means something. Something he didn't want found out. Means what? Cora Lane was a character, say, uh, drawn from real life. She's a real name, a real person somewhere. Excuse me, Mr. Craig. They're saying that Trent only realized it when it was almost too late to make the change. One thing's pretty clear to me, Grayson. Eric Trent didn't write the book. Somebody else did. Who would you say did write the book, Craig? The hero of the story is my guess. Stanley Fields. Only that name is probably an invention, or Eric Trent would have changed it. It figures. The book is an autobiographic work. A man's true personal history disguised as fiction. The personal history of someone Trent stole the manuscript from. Someone now dead, or Trent would never have dared to try for the big prize. Tram? Yes. Arrest Eric Trent. Book him for the murder of Oscar Sachs. You're sure? Sachs tumbled to some of the truth, and Trent shut him up. Trent was also behind the Mike Kelsey red herring. That was a trick to throw dust in our eyes. Arrest Trent, Lieutenant. And when that little chore's over, check police files and directories for a Cora Lane. Go to it, Trav. On this one, I'm making you a gift to the headlines. Ladies and gentlemen, when a great reporter wants to get the inside story of a great new car, he gives it a thorough test run. That's exactly what John Daly did with the new Pontiac. Here he is to tell you some of the outstanding facts of the new 1952 Pontiac and its spectacular dual-range performance. This is John Daly to tell you about a great advancement in automobile performance. 
the great new 1952 Pontiac with spectacular new dual range performance. A number of factors contribute to this sensational new kind of driving. Pontiac has combined a powerful high compression engine, new dual range hydromatic drive, and high performance economy axle into an amazing powertrain that gives you tailor-made performance. At the touch of a finger, you can have tremendous acceleration and get up and go for any occasion. With equal ease, you can choose a different type of performance, quiet, economical cruising for the open road. Drive the new 1952 Pontiac with dual range performance on display at your Pontiac dealer now. It's spectacular new proof that dollar for dollar you can't beat a Pontiac. The great new 1952 Pontiac with dual range performance is on display now at your nearest Pontiac dealer. See it. Drive it as soon as you can. And now back to Barry Craig. It took two days for Trav to get back to me. When he did, he had a lady with him. A gray lady with haunted eyes. This is Cora Lane, Craig. Cora Lane, Barry Craig. Mr. Craig. How do you do? How did you find her, Trev? Police files. The name of Cora Lane appeared on an old record card. She reported her husband missing some years back. Stanley, my husband. He left one morning, never returned. I was frightened. I, I imagined him injured, a traffic victim. I didn't know then that my husband had planned to just disappear. That he couldn't live in my world. That he had so much wanderlust. Her husband was the Stanley in the book. The author of it, as you theorize, Craig. Your husband was a writer? Yes. A writer all through him. Foolish, wild, irresponsible. And wonderful, too. Is he dead? Tell her, child. Yes, he's dead. Oh, According to Eric Trent's confession, your husband died of a tropical disease somewhere in the Pacific. Eric Trent was a drifter your late husband had taken up with. An odd thing, Craig. What odd thing? I offered you one of two cases the other day. Why well, bring that up now? You took one, but you solved both. Uh, what? Cora Lane is the maiden name of Mrs. Stanley Talbot. Mrs. Cora Talbot. Not the $20 a day in expenses deal I passed up. Yes. As it turned out, you found her missing husband. Hmm, a great lady, Trav, and all-around loser. Her life hasn't been good. Her life needs fixing. Mrs. Talbot? Yes, Mr. Craig. We're taking a ride, you and me. A ride? Across town. You've been poor, but now you're rich. That book of your husband's, The Cry of the Hyena, is $50,000 coming to you. And I'm going to stand over Grayson while he makes out that check. Good night, folks. See you next week. You have been listening to William Gargan in another exciting transcribed mystery drama from the adventures of Barry Craig, confidential investigator. Tonight's story, The Paper Bullets, was written by John Robert. Next week, it's the strange story of death and the purple cow, about which Barry Craig has this to say. Next week, I lose a client before I get him. A man dies in a hamburger joint. And a purple cow turns out to be neither a cow nor purple. See you next week, folks. Featured in the role of Judy was Barbara Weeks. Barry Craig, starring William Gargan, was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is Don Pardo speaking. Now enjoy Meredith Wilson's Music Room on NBC.